Welcome back to New Orleans Dot Football here at PJ's on Airline Highway, new location here. Beautiful store. Make sure you come and check it out. They are presenting sponsor, the best way to start every single day. I'm Nick Underhill here with Mike Triplett. We're going to get into our Super Bowl breakdown. The uh, the hire of Clint Kubiak is now about to become official. I would probably expect that after Mardi Gras. See some of the staff moves. Uh, a lot to a lot to talk about today. The 2024 season has officially begun now, which is what we've been waiting for for the Saints, and that's a good way to kick it off. Yeah, and if you are coming up to this location, make sure you buy your car from Matt Bowers. He is the best car dealer in the whole world. Get you the best prices, best customer care, in and out with the best experience. All right, let's hit these ads. The New Orleans Dot Football Show is proudly presented by PJ's Coffee. PJ's Coffee has some of the best drinks that you can find. They have locations all over the city. They have pastries and everything else you need to get your day started. So go check them out. Are you looking for the perfect engagement ring? Look no further than Friend & Company Fine Jewelers' new engagement salon. This new area houses a wide selection of engagement rings to choose from in all cuts, sizes, and colors. Their experienced staff offer five-star customer care to help you find the perfect ring to express your love. Visit their new engagement salon today. Friend and Company Fine Jewelers, the perfect ring for the perfect moment and also for the perfect person. 7713 Maple Street between Adams and Burdett Street. 504-866-5433. Friend and Company Fine Jewelers. Check them out at friendandcompany.com. Hard Hide Punch Tool Strawberry Whiskey is an 86 proof blend of aged wheat bourbon, American light whiskey, and fresh Punch Tool strawberries. Blended in New Orleans, it is not for the thin skinned. Look for it in your favorite stores, bars, and restaurants. New Orleans Stop Football is proud to be sponsored by Firehouse Subs. Make sure you check out their location on Veterans Boulevard. All right, let's get into the show. All right, let's get into our lead topic presented by Friend & Company Fine Jewelers, the official jewelers of the New Orleans Saints. Friend & Company Fine Jewelers has a beautiful engagement salon open, so if you're planning on proposing to somebody special this Valentine's season, make sure you check them out. Prices in all different categories. They can get you the big rock, the little rock. It'll be beautiful, <laughs> elegant. Whatever you need, they can make happen. They have a great selection of, of jewelry there, and while you're there, check out their Florida de Lee earring and necklace. They are specially priced for our NOF audience. All right. Saints new coaching hires can become official now that the Super Bowl is over. Clint Kubiak is going to come over as the offensive coordinator. He was a passing game coordinator yesterday for San Francisco. They have Andrew Janoco coming in as a QB coach. John Benton is the O-line coach. We don't yet know who the wide receiver coach is. Clancy Barone is going to be the tight end coach. Coach with Kubiak before in Denver, so there's some tie-in there. But top to bottom... Pretty much a whole entire new staff. Kevin Petrie's still around, a couple other assistants, but the main position coaches all pretty much out except for Barone, and we're going to see a whole new look staff. Uh, yeah, and this Barone had season. some ties to uh, to Kubiak. They worked together briefly, but they also worked on similar staffs. Like it was like Barone was in Denver for a long time before Kubiak got there the first time, and then he was in Minnesota. Um, uh, under under the Zimmer staff uh, for a long time, they worked uh, I think one year together. Um, I like the familiarity. I mean, if you like a young up and coming coach, Janoko's a pretty young coach. If you like a veteran who's been doing this for like forty years, John Benton is that. What I really like about John Benton, the offensive line coach. I mean, if you like outside zone and you talk about the Shanahan Kubiak tree, he is like part of the the base of that tree. I mean, he was working with Alex Gibbs when he invented outside zone. He was he was the offensive line coach on Kubiak's staff with the Texans that entire 06 to 13 time. Um, and then as soon as Kyle Shanahan got a job with the 49ers, he hired John Benton. When Robert Sala got the job with the Jets, he brought John Benton with him with a promotion. Like, this is a guy who teaches that run game. So if you want to install that run game, you've got one, one of the the, the founders of that run game uh, in John Benton. Um, and then, uh, you know, Janoko. He was part of Luke Getze's staff with the Bears. You mentioned that the Saints liked some of the things they saw from that staff. He was he was with uh, uh, Clint Kubiak in Minnesota. Um, so he's coached Kirk Cousins and Justin Fields. Couldn't be more different. Yeah. Their styles and their offenses. But I think this suits him a little bit better. It took them a while to f figure out round peg, square hole with uh, – with Justin Fields, I, I think they've got a quarterback who fits a little better. I mean, I like the idea that he's bringing in guys who know 
what he wants to run. Yeah, it's interesting you mentioned Alex Gibbs. Like, they've been trying to be an outside zone team forever. Like, Sean they Payton. Alex Gibbs yeah, in. Yeah. Sean Payton used to bring him in to kind of help with that. And they've just never really been a great outside zone running team. And this last year, I think they were fifth in the league in attempts of it. And it was just terrible. Like, they were awful. They averaged less than four yards per carry in it. I think they're going to need to revamp that offensive line. I don't think some of the guys they have fit the prototypes that like the 49ers like at those spots. So I think you're going to probably see some of those body types change. Like they like kind of big guards and the 49ers like smaller guards. So it's going to be fascinating to see how that changes a little bit. Janoko is kind of fascinating to me. He, he's obviously got the tie in with Kubiak. You mentioned he was there in Minnesota. He is a three-step job evangelist like he <laughs> hates long plays he likes quick game and it's kind of fits a little bit with Derek Carr like believe it or not he completed 82.3 percent of his passes last year on three-step drops had a 108.9 rating both of those were in the top seven in the league he only had 68 attempts out of it though Purdy though for San Francisco had 125 so this could be something that they could do to kind of accentuate his game and, and Janoku I was like reading a lot of his interviews like He's talked a lot about how much he likes analytics and how much he studies that stuff. He goes to PFF, he goes through it, and he uses that stuff to kind of guide their decisions. And if you're just looking at those numbers, those are hard not to notice and say, hey, like, why don't we do this more instead yeah. of like all these shots down the field, all these plays to the, the outside? Like, we've talked before about it, like his throw chart, you break it up into the nine quadrants, like they're all over on the, the side quadrants, and his numbers aren't great there, but they kept throwing there last year. Like, let the data guide your decisions a little bit, and it seems like this is a guy that can help him do that. So I, I like the idea of all these hires overall. Like, get the guys you know, get the guys that fit, and move forward like that. You, you've you been talking about how this team so badly needs yards after the catch, too. That's another way to get them. Get it to the playmaker and let that be the play design as opposed yeah. to having all the time be them getting, getting out of their routes. I've never heard an argument against – three-step drop and get actually I've heard the opposite I've covered Cam Jordan for over a decade and all I ever hear is when the Saints don't get sacks is him saying well the quarterback just gets rid of the ball too quick well, okay good why not <laughs> why not do that especially when you've got Chris Olave and Alvin Kamara and all these other playmakers on this team Rashid Shaheed we've we've talked about um you know and, and this is coming from an offense that just had Debo Samuel and all these creative guys I mean I, I, I love the idea I I think this offense could be really good for Derek Carr funny enough I did a story with Kyle Shanahan, when I was working at ESPN, I helped with the Super Bowl coverage um, when the Falcons were in the Super Bowl, the 28-3 to Super Bowl. And, and I did a story on Kyle Shanahan and Matt Ryan and how long it took him to convince Matt Ryan that like play action and under center and all that was the right way. And, and there was a, a learning curve with that. There will be a learning curve with Derek Carr. They're not going to show up and Derek Carr is going to say, you know, you, you've solved everything. But, but I think ultimately – Gosh, I, re I'm re I really think it's the right offense for him. I mean, he does need to buy in quickly, though. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's imperative because, look, I think if they stink next year and everybody gets fired, like Derek Carr's probably out, too. Like the next coach probably isn't going to want to marry himself to him. They're going to want a clean slate. They're going to want to start over. This is kind of like he, he needs to prove something here. And I don't want to say it's his last chance because if things went sideways here, someone's going to probably pick him up. Yeah. But it's his last chance to make real money, I think. If this thing blows up, like he's not going to make $30 million a year at his next stop. He's going to be at that Baker Mayfield type level. He's going to be viewed that way. So this is his last chance to kind of be a premium product. And I think he needs to, to prove it very, very quickly. One thing that I think is an interesting offshoot of this. Remember when DA hired Joe Woods and Marcus Robertson and everybody's like, oh, DA's just hiring his guys. Like, it had a negative stigma to it because they, everything DA does has, has a negative stigma to it right now. This seems like the right way to do it, though, right? I, like, I was thinking of it in terms of, like, all-star refereeing crews. Like, you could put together this, hey, there's this young hotshot who has some ideas over there, and, like, hey, I'm going to try working with this guy. I like some of the things I've seen him doing over there. But, like, if you bring people in who you're like, this is the offense I want to run, you know how to install it, that seems like the right way to go, doesn't it? Well, I mean, like, if you're, you know, a Spanish-speaking place and you hire people that speak Spanish, you're going to be able to communicate better than if you hire a bunch of people that speak French. So, like, if you want to break it down and they need people to teach it quickly, they should be well-versed in the, the, you know, the, the universe and know how to break it down and know how to communicate the way that Kubiak wants them to communicate. And then you're all on the same page. But if you have to learn the language and then figure out how to communicate, it's going to kind of slow it down a little. And... 
Yeah, last year that was the most annoying thing. The fans are all like, well, why is DA hiring people he knows? I don't want anyone connected to him. Well, is he supposed to like hire people he hates? Like, <laughs> it made no sense to me. But they got better because of it. They got rid of all the guys that Sean brought in and, and brought in DA's guys, and they got better because of it. it. And I thought they coached better this year on the defensive side of the ball. Like, it felt more together. Not that the year before was terrible, but it was just – it was more cohesive. They made more plays. Everybody was on the same page. But – yeah, like Kubiak should have all of his guys. And we saw the one hire on offense had no ties to anything. Cody Burns, like, I don't think it, it worked out great there. So I think you can bring in maybe like one, but like overall, like it should be people that are part of the system, part of a tree that have ties to it. And it shouldn't just be kind of like, like use the officiating staffs. So like they do like these super crews and, and like they never don't, works. It yeah. never works. It's always you want a mess. You guys who yeah. you know how to communicate with them. Yeah, yeah. you got to have some chemistry. I, I think it matters. Uh, a whole a whole lot what do you think this does for da though like he went out he got the guy that he was looking for he got the coach he wanted i it, from what i heard it, it, it was zach robinson dan pitcher and kubiak were kind of their cloud of guys i don't know that there was a ranking of them i know kubiak was was very high uh they obviously wanted this system robinson got hired quickly pitcher never actually became available so i mean they kind of got the guy that they wanted yeah. overall do you think it like i don't know improves his view the stock of him his q rating like we often talk about Q rating yes yeah i mean absolutely i mean it was as probably as low as it's ever been since since he's been here um and this hire kind of seemed to surprise some fans almost like oh my gosh they got one of the top guys that interviewed a bunch of places that was like high on the list like wow i didn't know da had that in him i mean that's huge um what it does for his coaching tenure i mean it just it buys him a month like, yeah. it buys him a, all right, I'll wait to see what it looks like in September. If this team's one in three, it doesn't do anything for him. Like, but this is what he needs to be a successful head coach. It's very similar to Sean Payton. Sean Payton spent his entire career trying to find the right defensive coordinator. Like, Dennis Allen is a defensive guy. He wants to hand the offense over to someone. He wants to have some input on what it's going to look like. But he wants to find the right person that can make that offense cook. His head coaching future and career depends on it so and this is going to be probably his last chance so this has to be the right hire um but i think he's off to a good start because he got one of the top choices the thing i like about him more than zach robinson and dan pitcher too is those guys had never called plays before and this guy has so gives him a chance to i think maybe do it more quickly without growing pains too yeah he knows what he doesn't know like as far yeah. as the play calling so he's learned some of those lessons i think i, I don't think minnesota was a disaster. It's interesting to hear Minnesota people talk about it because they sound very down on it a little bit, but like the numbers are solid. So I don't know. We're going to see. Um, Matthew Collier was on here and just kind of said that, like, you know, kind of some of those late game situations they had issues, but hopefully he's learned from that. Um, yeah, he <laughs> I, don't, got I don't that know if Kyle Shanahan's the, the person to, learn from, oh, no. <laughs> to, learn, to fix your late game issues, but. Uh, yeah, I don't know. Ho point. Hopefully he's figured some of that stuff out, though, but he's had time to evaluate yeah, it. Yeah, people didn't see your interview with Matthew Collar. That was great. Uh, I mean, he might have got that job too early, but that's not the Saints' problem. I mean, he, he, he got thrown into that offensive coordinator role with the Vikings very young, and I think there was some stigma that, oh, he's Gary Kubiak's son and Zimmer and Kubiak are friends, but he got to be the OC there. Then he went to Denver under – uh, Nathaniel Hackett, totally different staff, got to call plays there. Then he got to work for Kyle Shanahan. So his experience level since that um, ha has been like every every like graduate level class you would want a young offensive coordinator to take. I think the one thing it does for DA too is it kind of it kills some of the narratives. Like the nobody wants to work yeah. for him. He doesn't want strong people around. Like that was always like the stupidest stuff people were saying and that goes away at least it buys him vibes for the off season which he got last year with Derek Carr and then it didn't really uh deliver into the season but yeah I think it definitely helps a little bit though I mean the fact that you could go out and get this guy makes it easier to get the next one you know you can yeah. probably get a stronger staff all that stuff so I think it does help but yeah I think he needs to be able to let go a little bit the same way look Sean had his hands fingers way too much into the 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 Rob Ryan stuff and then DA came and he was able to kind of let go, let DA run his scheme. I think that too many people probably had their hands into what Pete was doing when it becomes, you know, a contingent instead of a singular voice. I, I think it's always worse. So if you got a strong singular voice, you run it um, a little bit better. All right, let's get into our moment of the day presented by New Orleans Hamburger and Seafood Company. Going back to Kyle Shanahan and the Super Bowl, just kind of watching it last night. Uh, Give me, give me your, your top two or three takeaways. It's funny. I said at the beginning, I just want a good game. And I couldn't even decide who I was rooting for. I, I, I think, you know, 
Shanahan and, and this 49ers team deserve one. I like seeing the greatness of Pat Mahomes. I, you know, when you're watching something like that in real time, you can't see enough of it. But, like, toward the end, I was like, oh, shoot. Like, selfishly from a Saints perspective, like, do I want their offensive coordinator coming off this tough loss? Do I want him coming off a win? Does one make him hungry? Would you know? Does does one just uh, kill some of the buzz of his hire? Um, I don't. I don't know either way. I mean. It wasn't like the 49ers blew this game on offense. I mean, I'm very curious when we talked to Clint Kubiak for the first time if he had any input on the most creative play of the game, the Jawan Jennings, Jennings pass to uh, to Christian McCaffrey. Um, obviously, they didn't quite do enough, but I, I don't think it was like an, a failure of offensive imagination or anything. So I'm still excited to see somebody from that 49ers offensive coaching staff come bring that to, to the Saints, even though – Look, if, they, if, if, if their biggest failing is that they can get to the Super Bowl and not finish the job, I'll, I'll take that for New Orleans right now. <laughs> no doubt. I mean, look, my, my thing, there are a few things. I mean, I think, first of all, the importance of the quarterback is so – it's just so apparent. And it's not like this isn't a high-level takeaway. It's just obvious. But yeah. I think you saw the difference. I don't think Kansas City had a great plan and their quarterback was able to overcome it. I think the 49ers had a great plan and their quarterback wasn't able to overcome it. And when they took away the run a little bit and they made him stay in the pocket, like he couldn't really make the throws. Like things kind of fell apart. And Chiefs were blitzing the crap out of him in the second half. No doubt. And then, you know, you're trying to blitz Mahomes and you get murdered for it because he (laughs) he sees the field quicker and sees everything quicker. But, you know, I think Purdy's very much, you know, a a system guy. And I don't think there's anything wrong with that. But at some point when your quarterback has to make plays, there was one guy that was able to do it. And I don't think the other guy could. And that was a huge, uh, a huge thing for them. But, like, I, I mean, I think it's kind of – there's going to be all this stuff about, like, Shanahan and choking and all that stuff, but, like, your special teams wasn't good enough. You had – Kansas City fumbled five times and only lost one. San Francisco fumbled twice and lost two. They got no points off the turnovers. McCaffrey blew it early in the game. I texted you, like, at the end of the first quarter. I was like, they're going to lose this game. They've had too much opportunity, yeah. and they didn't take advantage. And at some point, like, that other quarterback is going to wake up. But, you know, as far as the Saints are concerned, the perspective of it, I mean, you know – for me, it was just you need good pass rushers, and your quarterback has to be a little bit better. And the Saints, I don't know, have either of those boxes checked at this point. I'll take Trent McDuffie, too. He was pretty good. Oh, man, he was <laughs> oh my awesome. goodness, on the blitz and the coverage. Um, it's funny. My son was watching the game with me, and he goes, I think coverage is more important than pressure because, look, Mahomes got sacked three times, and that didn't beat him. But uh, the, the Chiefs' secondary was knocking every pass down uh, in that game. The uh, It's funny. One of my takeaways was I'm glad we're not sitting here talking about refs. Oh, um, yeah. That there was no big controversial referee moment, and I'm glad we're not talking about, like, some coach's bad decision. And then I wake up and I see all these articles about did Kyle Shanahan blow the game with the offense, like, major media outlets saying it's obvious that he should have deferred. And I even saw one person compare it to college. It's not the same as college. In college, everybody always gets a possession. We actually, me and you and a, and a friend of ours, had a text discussion while it was happening and, like, debating the merits of – whether you should want the ball first. And that was my first thought because I want the ball third, which is exactly what Kyle Shanahan said. If they go touchdown, touchdown. If they go field goal, field goal. If they go punt, punt. Now it's sudden death. You want to be the one who has the ball first in sudden death. But I get the idea. The Chiefs said we would have kicked off because we want to know what we have to do. Either way, there's merits for both. And this will be kind of interesting if this continues into our future, what teams do, because it'll, kind of, it'll, it'll kind of vary. But either way, it's a 50-50 decision or close to it, to say Kyle Shanahan obviously screwed that up and, and he blew it, no way. No way is there an obvious choice to make there. The, the only thing I thought really looked bad about it is that his players were talking after the game and they didn't yeah. know the rules. Like, you got to know true. the rules. Everybody needs to know the rules. Um, yeah, but I was reading, like, some analytic stuff this morning about the different scenarios, and, and it was it was a toss-up either way. Toss because up. if you take the ball first and if you go for two, like, maybe you're up eight, but what if you miss a two-point conversion? Now you're allowing someone to come behind you and they kick it. Or what if you kick the field goal and then they go for two on the second possession and you lose that way? So, There's so I don't, I don't know. It, yeah. But then if you, you're tied, you have the advantage because you do get the sudden death uh, on, the, on the third possession. So I think it's kind of – The other thing that – struck me the way that game was being played a lot of people say you base these decisions on how the way it was being played it felt like they were matching each other possession for possession the whole game it was always a one score game the entire time the Chiefs only touchdown in regulation was after that muffed punt and then it was what a one play touch they had no touchdown drive so everyone being like well obviously the Chiefs are going to go down and score they didn't go down and score for 60 minutes why do you automatically assume you can't hold them to a field goal in overtime I, I don't know it, it felt like I actually thought we were going to see field goal field goal field goal that's how I thought yeah and I thought the 49ers that's were going to win that's how the game was going for sure yeah my biggest beef with it is that 
I feel like we should have the same rules during the regular season yeah. as the postseason. Like maybe there's a scenario where it can end in a tie in the regular season, so the game doesn't go indefinitely. That but what you said you put it on coaching, but the players in the Super Bowl don't know the overtime rule because you've changed it so many times that the players can't even keep up. That that is a little bit of an indictment. Yeah, yeah. Um, all right. That's it for the first break here. We're going to hit some ads, and we'll be back right after this, uh, talking about the quarterback, how Kubiak will influence their draft decisions, will the prototypes change, all that, and a lot more coming right up after this. It's carnival time at New Orleans Hamburger and Seafood Company. Our gumbo combos are back. Enjoy our hot gumbo fries and your choice of shrimp, catfish, soft shell crab, or frog legs starting at $9.99 at New Orleans Hamburger and Seafood Company. Are you tired of renting and ready to own your dream home? Contact Jefferson Financial Federal Credit Union, your trusted source for home loans. Our competitive rates and flexible terms can help make your home ownership dreams a reality. If you're a first-time home buyer or looking to refinance, our experienced lenders are here to help. Our online application process allows you to apply on your schedule. It's quick, easy, and convenient. Visit us online at jeffersonfinancial.org to learn more. Federally insured by NCUA, equal housing lender. Martin Wine and Spirits is home to a selection of hand-picked barrel-select bourbon, whiskeys, and much, much more. They are family-owned and operated since 1946 and specialize in wine, spirits, gourmet food, gift baskets, catering, and tasting events. They have many locations, so they're never too far away. You can check them out in Metairie, New Orleans, Mandeville, and Baton Rouge. Or, if it's more convenient, you can always shop online. Whether you're a wine novice or a seasoned collector... You'll enjoy the Martin Wine and Spirit experience. All right, welcome back to PJ's Coffee on Airline Highway in Metairie. If you're coming here, make sure you type Metairie into your uh, GPS because it'll try to take you out the counter. And I don't know if you're trying to go out the counter. Um, if you are signed up for NewOrleans.Football, make sure you do that today. Use the code Motion save 20% off your first payment. All right, Trip, you wrote about the QBs today, continuing your series, the position rankings, where they need. Uh, what do you expect the depth chart to look like this upcoming season? Does Jake Hayner have any shot of actually being the number two QB? Is Jameis Winston going to be back? What are kind of your main takeaways of that position? Yeah, there's kind of fascinating questions throughout. I mean, the most fascinating question that I wrote about is do they consider drafting one because there's so many good – it's not a must to draft one. It's not like they have to get the guy in the building. There's just so many to choose from. I, I think it absolutely has to be on the table. But let's assume for purposes – of this conversation that they're not drafting one in round one or two. What, what does your depth chart look like? If you don't bring back Jameis Winston, I don't think you can just say right now, no, Hayner's the guy. We're good. He could compete for that job. He could win it. I, I think we saw enough potential from him. That wouldn't shock me. But I think a veteran has to be in the mix. My kind of bold prediction is I kind of think Jameis Winston comes back. Even after that controversy at the end of the season, even after two years in a row where him and – Dennis Allen have butted heads, partly because I look at the landscape and I'm just like, where's Jameis Winston going to go? Because it's like there is now a veteran for every team. Like with five new quarterbacks expected to come in and in the first round of the draft, these guys are already free agents this year. Ryan Tannehill, Russell Wilson's expected to be one, Kirk Cousins, uh, Baker Mayfield, Jimmy Garoppolo's expected to be one, Gardner Minshew, Joe Flacco, Jacoby Brissett, Tyrod Taylor, Marcus Mariota, Carson Wentz, Mason Rudolph, Drew Locke. Then you get into Josh Dobbs, Tyler Huntley, Blaine Gabbert, Trevor Simeon. And uh, one that's really interesting to me is Sam Darnold because Clint Kubiak just worked with him this year. He's a free agent. But there's so many of these guys playing musical chairs that, that if Jameis has an offer to stay here because it helps the Saints' salary cap – might be his best offer. He obviously loves the community. But if it's not Jameis, I think it's got to be one of those guys. I, I am curious about Darnold just because I, I'm very curious if Kubiak likes him. Um, but other than that, I, I think you get one guy off that list that doesn't cost a lot of money. It's, it's, I think it's maybe the most fascinating decision. It, and it's, it's tough because I, I can see it going either which way. Like if I'm Jameis, I probably want to leave. I think he really likes living here. I mean, there's the great picture of him out at yeah. the Mardi Gras yeah. parade, like smiling, and yeah. he obviously loves living here. But I don't know if this is the best fit for him. Right. I don't think he's ever going to get the opportunity to start. But if you come back here, you're playing behind a quarterback who got hurt several times last year, and maybe this is a time where the system clicks and you kind of take it and run away with it. If you're the Saints, outside of how the season ended, he kind of is a great locker room guy. Teammates like, obviously love him. Guy. Yeah, I mean – he, he kind of is, is great for the team culture overall, even though he kind of went against the coach's wishes at the end of the season. 
But if you're Clint Kubiak and you're kind of having input on the, the discussion, is he the guy that's going right, to like fit true. in and run he this system? He might not system? fit this offense, yeah. Yeah, I mean, you kind of want like – and I hate to like I I don't want to make it sound like I'm disparaging Jameis, but I think if you're like pick between two prototypes that they've recently had, like if Andy Dalton could be your backup or Jameis, I think Andy Dalton kind of fits some of this just like dink and dunk type system a little bit better. Where I think Jameis was probably better in a system where he can paint a little bit more outside the lines and take deep shots and all that different stuff. So I don't know. Like I, I would probably I don't know if you could get Sam Darnold or, or somebody. I could see that making a lot more sense for this team, but. Yeah, it's tough. But look, if he goes, I, like I don't, I'm not there on Jay Kaner and like all apologies to like Fletcher Mackle. Like I don't see it happening, even though like you know there's some guys out there like pushing it like he is the future. I I don't think that's the case. Like I I think you need to probably get somebody else. I think you need a stronger backup. I haven't seen it yet. Um, you know I think he you could try have to keep that developing career, though. Yeah, he, you keep trying to. Um, we had um. Dane Brugler on right after the draft last year, and he was the only one who didn't make a Drew Brees comparison because they're the same height and they have all that history. Together. He compared him to Taylor Heineke. And if he if he develops into a Taylor Heineke, he could have a 10-year career as an NFL backup. I just – I don't know if he's ready to do it yet. They got, he got no no time to to – Work on anything yeah. this year. I mean, Fletcher was like compared him to Purdy. Like I just don't, <laughs> I don't see, I don't necessarily see. I think that's like a huge leap. But yeah, yeah I mean, look, I, I would try to get somebody else. You got to bring someone. You you can't entrust him to be your like. He needs to beat somebody out, and he didn't do that last year. And you know, I think you just got to make sure you have that barrier there. And if he is, you know, you bring in Darnold, and he ends up being better than him, so be it. Great, like that's a great problem to have. But I don't think you can say like we've seen enough out of Jay Kaner. I mean. He had a decent summer, and then he had a, a steroid suspension. I mean, I just think there's a lot that he still has to kind of do. Prove. You try to go as minimum salary as possible. I mean, do you try to get in on Tannehill or Garoppolo if he's released? I mean, I, I think we think Cousins, Russell Wilson, and Mayfield are out. But like, do you pay for a Jacoby Brissett? Do you What's pay for a Tyrod Taylor, or do you, you know, or do you try to just go give me a guy who's what do, what do we think they salary? cost? I mean, some of those guys might cost. Five to eight million is that too much? Yeah. I, I probably cap it at like four to five. Yeah, I think I I, I don't know. Like it just feels like if, if your quarterback goes out, you're you're kind of screwed. Yeah. And then I, you know they're still Taysom. Like, yeah, are they better than Taysom? Like be yeah, more willing true. to go to Taysom if, if some of this stuff falls apart. I mean, why spend the money to to have someone that's equal to someone that's already on your your roster? But yeah, I would go kind of cheap on it, and then you know hope for hope for the best. But if you if you're facing all these injuries, like you're you're kind of cooked anyhow. But um. Got call. You're, you're on Jameis staying, staying with the team? Just just because there's so much musical chairs, I think the Saints will make Jameis an offer because it'll help their salary cap so much to keep him instead of just eating all the dead money from his contract. And I just don't know that, that the opportunity is about there. I would not want to be a veteran backup quarterback right now. So many of these guys are just going to have nothing left for them. I mean, there's, like I said, five, six new rookies expected to come in the top 50 picks of this year's draft. They'll take up one, two spots on someone's depth chart. I, I just, I mean, where does Carson Wentz go? Where does Tyrod Taylor go? Where does Jacoby Brissett go? Where do, I mean, Mason Rudolph, Joe Flacco just had that finish here. Drew Locke, where do these guys all end up? I, I, I think you latch on to the first team that offers you a job almost if you're some of yeah, these guys. Yeah, the, the cap thing makes it super interesting. I, I like the Darnold aspect of it, though, because yeah. you, you can bring someone into that room that already knows the system. I think it, it helps he, kind if, of with if the If I'm Sam curve. Darnold, I'm like, Clint, it was awesome working with you. I'm doing whatever I can to stay in San Francisco yep. and be in this offense one injury or, or one slump away from getting a chance to run the 49ers offense. Yeah. It'd be hard to, they, they hard to be pry me out of there. Absolutely. <laughs> Here's another reason it becomes interesting with Jameis. So Cam Jordan had some interesting comments this week about the touchdown against the Falcons, and we're like six weeks removed from this happening, and they're still talking about it, where he said he didn't like DA apologizing to the Falcons after the game. Here's the quote. Half of my gripe was Dennis ended up saying sorry, and I'm like, why would you say sorry? Say sorry we didn't go for 50. Do you feel like this is a bad sign that this talking point isn't going away? And secondly, that people are just as comfortable talking about the head coach yeah. and kind of questioning him out in the open at the Super Bowl with the national media. This quote alone doesn't bother me because this is Cam, and Cam during Super Bowl week. Cam, who we love, he got our media award last year. He's going to be a Saints Hall of Famer the second he's allowed to be a Saints Hall of Famer. But 
you know, Cam's auditioning for TV jobs a lot. I mean, he, he gives me the vibe. He's like, he reminds me a lot of like what, what Jason Kelsey's out there doing right now. He's, he's, uh, like almost like a showman, like in, in pro wrestling form. The rest of that interview also included things like calling them the Catlanta Falcons and yeah. uh, talking about how uh, they should have, you know, uh, Arthur taking a shot at Arthur Smith, uh, walking off the field and getting fired and everything. He will take a shot at the Falcons anywhere he can. So when he says, if I was DA, I'd never apologize to the Falcons. That's part of his shtick. I'm much more concerned about what Cam Jordan said when the season was over when somebody said directly to him, does this team believe in D.A.? And his answer was, I mean, D.A. is our head coach. So as long as that's the same sentence, it's going to be the same sentence. That is the lamest uh, way to defend your head coach who has been your defensive coordinator for the last eight years. Like, your answer to that is, of course we still believe in D.A. Like, and and it, it was kind of a hemming, hawing, like – it's it's the total body of yeah there's there's the lack of confidence that we feel for da the 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 team is also in he's got to prove us something mode absolutely no question about it i don't blame cam like i I understand where he's coming from and some of the stuff we were hearing last season it makes sense why there would be kind of some hemming and hawing about that whole situation i think there's a lot to prove on the other hand if you're da i think you're kind of hoping that Cam Jordan, the guy that works harder than anybody, that doesn't miss a practice, that plays through every injury, that's kind of the Iron Man. That you kind of want to be able to point to him and say, "This is the tone setter for our team," and follow behind him and do all the things he's doing. And then these comments take that yeah, ability yeah. away from it, and just kind of being real, where Cam's at in his career, like the leadership aspect is kind of his greatest value at this point. He had two sacks last year. I mean, again, though, he played through injury and all that stuff. Maybe he bounces back, but. Maybe he doesn't, but the fact that, that he should be kind of your main culture guy, and I don't think that you have that right now, but I think it's on the coaching staff to earn that back and to yep. prove it and to get everybody to buy back in and, and to have it be kind of what it was at the end of the season for the whole entire year and not have players talking about how they're kind of succeeding and playing for each other and emphasizing for concern. each other, for each other, like as if to say, yeah. this isn't for the coaches, we're doing this for one another. It's a major concern. It's yeah. it's. I think there is enough respect for DA to buy him the zero and zero start. Like, show me something, let's get off to a hot start, and let's roll with it. There is not enough for him to survive a one and three start. There just isn't. I think the Kubiak hire is huge in that aspect, too, because players like Mike Thomas were speaking openly about the difficulty that he thought they were going to have getting a good coach, and then he was able to go out and do it. So I think it at least quells the waters there, too. It's not just in the public or anything. Like, that locker room is, is watching all that stuff, too. All right. Let's go to the Martin's question of the day. Martin's is home to a wide selection of hand-picked barrels, select bourbon, whiskeys, and more. Martin's so much more than wine. How much influence do we expect Kubiak to have on the draft, the type of players they go after, the changing prototypes, anything like that? What do you expect it to kind of look like going forward? Two things stand out to me in this question. Is One is, does he want a quarterback? I don't think he gets to decide that. I think Mickey Loomis, Gail Benson, and, and Dennis Allen probably in that order get to decide that. Um, if they want to invest in, in a quarterback. I mean, Jeff Ireland and obviously the grades they're putting together. But that is a major decision that I don't think Clint Kubiak gets to decide yet. I don't think he can come in and say, I want J.J. McCarthy. Give him to me. Like, <laughs> I don't know if he has that kind of influence. But um, the offensive line is the, the second thing that comes to my mind. They're going to want to fit his system, the one we talked about uh, that they want to run, that's so heavy on outside zone, the athleticism of the guards that you talked about. And and I think we think offensive line is a top priority, maybe with that 14th overall pick, certainly with either pick 14 or 45, or if they end up with another pick in the first two rounds. And I think they absolutely will want his input on who's the perfect who's the perfect offensive lineman to fit this system. Yeah, and I think along with that, you know, one of the things I think they have to kind of get is is a two way player, whether it's a, a wide receiver, a tight end, someone that can block and go down the field. I mean, you saw it yesterday. Like, I don't think it's it's, it's essential to have these tight like you look at Miami running their system like Tyree Kill isn't a great blocker Waddle isn't a great blocker but they're both kind of willing a little bit I think that's been one of the big knocks on Olave like he is willing but I don't think he's very good at it yet um Rashid I don't know that I've ever seen a player where I'm like wow Rashid made like a good block there like I think they both got to get a little bit better at that but I think you got to get someone that's just that's kind of part of their their game and I think that's something that they'll probably value a little bit you know on the quarterback thing it if you have a guy in the room that's new that you're high on right now, though, and he's standing on a table yeah. for certain people, like maybe it helps with you know a day two pick or so, a day three pick, sure, someone that you're sure. bringing in to develop. Like, hey, I really like this guy. I think I can make something happen with him. You know, all this stuff. Like, I think it's going to be heard, and maybe it opens the door for it. 
But yeah, I don't think that he gets to come in and say, I don't want to work with Derek Carr or anything <laughs> like that right away. It's probably going to take a little bit of time. But yeah, I mean, obviously you draft people to fit the system. Yeah. And even on defense, the system changed with some of the guys after Nielsen. Like we've heard that they're going to look at different types of pass rushers and stuff like that. So just whenever you're bringing people in, you want to get people that they want to work with, whether it's coaches, players, whatever. So yeah, I think it's going to have a huge impact on some of the stuff we see going forward. But the prototypes are the prototypes. The foundation is a foundation. I just think maybe some of the body types change just ever so slightly or, hey, I like three cone time here because it translates to this. Like there's going to probably be some small differences going forward. But um, that's all we got for you guys today. Thanks for joining us. Coming to you again from PJ's on Airline. Make sure you come and check out this location. Beautiful store, great staff. Uh, and if you need a new car, check out my guy, Matt Bowers. All right, we'll see you next time.